Hey everyone, so just a little something different today. Uh, Jay Bates, Nick Ferry, and I thought it'd be kind of a fun idea to do a three-person Q&A. So we collected a bunch of questions from the viewers and we recorded um, basically an hour of us answering questions, the three of us, which was a lot of fun. I'm not sure where this is going to go, if we're going to do it again or what, but if you enjoyed it, let me know, give us some feedback, let us know what you think about this as a concept. If you have questions that you would want to have us answer in a future one of these things, leave those as well in the comments. Just preface that with uh, Q&A, just so I can pull them out a little bit easier. So, here we go. <laughs> Hey guys, thanks for tuning in. Uh, my name is Nick Ferry, and I am joined with my buddy Matt. Hello. And my buddy Jay. Hello. <laughs> and, we, and we figured we would put together kind of an impromptu question and answer thing. We were just hanging in a hangout one night, and I uh, thought this would be a kind of a cool thing to be able to um, get some questions from you guys, is, and then is you know give out answers to some of the stuff that we might not be able to put in uh, our videos. So we we figured we would put that together for you tonight. We asked on a couple of our channels to uh, get some questions from you, and man, a lot of good questions here. So, um, Matt, do you want to start with the questions? Do I start at the top? Uh, you start let's... where it says Matt. You know what? I am on the wrong page. There we go. Well, he gets on the right page. Let's start with the most common topic by far. Uh, the most common question was: Do you guys still have regular jobs or businesses, or is this your primary income source? Uh, your websites and YouTube channels. What do you guys do for a living? How does one get the flash, f the cash flow to work? Why don't you start that it? off, Nick? Um, I do not do this for a living. I and, and I hope to at some point, someday, uh, maybe in the near future. Who knows? Um, so I can't necessarily. I mean, I can somewhat answer the question to how to get the cash flow to work. But uh, the uh, my other two uh, co-hosts here are actually doing it. Uh, for a living, but uh, I, I work in the glass industry, and so I'm kind of trying to juggle YouTube and making videos for that, as well as my day job and, of course, my family life. Matt, what about what about you? I am doing this for a living, as as you mentioned. Um, but most of my income is not just from the YouTube ad revenue. Um, just like any business, your revenue stream should be diversified. So, like for instance, my ad revenue from YouTube is maybe a fifth of my total income, but you know I have other um, streams of income from I mean, affiliate links, and then I do sell lumber as well. That's probably my largest chunk of my income right now is the lumber sales. Lumber sales. You're a lumberjack. Lumber sales. Lumberjacking. Uh, this is my regular job since August 22nd, 2014. No one's counting. Uh, it's been <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a count. That yeah. was the date. Oh, well, yeah. So that's been my <laughs> normal job since then. And... Um, it's been a lot of fun. As far as cash flow goes, man, you have to, you really have to, to diversify in order to do this, in my experience, uh, simply because YouTube doesn't really pay much at all, like a lot less than what people normally think. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Well, I mean, being that was our most common topic question, do you want to expand on that? Either one of you, as far as, you know, you say diversification of revenue streams, what, what are some of the revenue streams? Um, Outside, I think one of you guys mentioned Amazon affiliate links, but what else is there? For me, I've got all right. So everything's around the website. Uh, you can um, search all kinds of topics for website revenue or whatever. But I, you know, ads on the website, plan sales, um, Amazon affiliate links, multiple ad networks actually, and then an occasional. I've only done th about four or five sponsored videos and stuff like that. So. Um, Having everything in one basket is kind of scary, especially if you're not, um, you have no control over that company's terms of service. It can instantly change and change your your business, basically. That brings up an interesting point. Have you ever thought of diversifying over to uh, another video platform? Me personally, no. There's either, not an, either one of you, I guess. There's not really another option that. What's the only other option? What is it? Just Vimeo? I don't, which Vimeo really, is, is, is one that I'm, uh, that I'm aware of. I'm not quite sure if that's a... Uh, and I know Facebook is starting to uh, do um, revenue splits, but that's, I guess, with only the top Facebookers. Yeah, I, I've got a hate relationship with Facebook. I, I, <laughs> uh, that, that, could be, that could be an hour-long segment. Just, yeah, that's a topic for another day. 
but going back to revenue streams, Matt, you um, you were talking about uh, you know wood sales and stuff like that, and I know you you make quite a few uh, cutting boards with some of your um, offcuts. Is there anything else that's kind of maybe unique to your situation that you're you know getting income from? Um, the only thing I haven't mentioned yet is like Patreon. I've got that as well, um, and I'm starting to get into the classes as well. So again, another revenue stream in the bucket. I'm going into the bucket. All right. Yeah. Since yeah, you mentioned thanks. since you mentioned classes, real quick, you want to give a shameless plug for your <laughs> guild project you're doing? Sure. I am building a sofa table. It is behind me, but you can't see me. It's off camera, but it, it's got a lot of good joinery in it. Um, dovetails and mortise and tenons and breadboard joinery, all that fun stuff that is available in the Wood Whisperer Guild. And uh, we're probably going to publish this soon, right? Yeah, yeah, relatively okay. soon. I would say within yeah. a few days. If you head over there and use the, co- the coupon code SLABS, you can save twenty percent off that class. And that was woodwhisperer.com? The woodwhisperguild.com, and they'll be there. And if you use that coupon code before the end of the year, December thirty first, two thousand fifteen, twenty percent off that class. Nice. That's awesome. That's that's a really cool opportunity. Well, I suppose we can get right into the the list of other questions that we had here, starting with Matt. This is from Jay Rowe. Do you now work in your shop full time, or do you still have other employment? Is that yeah. kind of the same thing we just answered. Yeah, yeah. yeah. same thing. Well, um, I don't work in my shop full time. I am on my computer full time in that sense. This is way more of a desk job than a shop job. I second that by far. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely get to that because I think that question would come up later as well. Um, well, I guess moving to the next one since we pretty much covered the uh, revenue streams and, and, and employment. Uh, Liam wants to know, do I have any interest in getting a lathe? It says, do you have any interest? I do, um, and hopefully sooner than later, but as, as a lot of things in a, in a wood shop, it's just kind of budget allowing. And I'm not typically the type of person to buy into a uh, smaller tool and then have to sell it later and then upgrade and, and worry about that. I would a lot of times just tend to save my money and buy ultimately what I want. But Matt, what about you and lathes? I have a lathe. I've had a lathe for a long time. Um, I'm on my second lathe now, and I really enjoy the occasional turning. <laughs> and uh, I don't really care for spindle turning. I only really <laughs> care about uh, bowl turning. <laughs> I hate spindle turning. <laughs> so what you're saying is you want to make a thousand more spindles for the baby crib. I am done making spindles for cribs or bassinets. I'm done. <laughs> I hear you. I... Um, <laughs> I do have interest in getting a lathe, but I'm running out of shop real estate because I have a massive four by eight table sitting in the middle of it, taking up most <laughs> of my space and the miter saw station, which those two things I don't really want to give up. So I'm just running out of space. There's so many things that I want, but you can only <laughs> cram so much stuff in there and still have enough room to work around. So yes, I'm interested in one. Don't see myself getting one anytime soon at all. But the neat thing about a lathe is um, versus, say, like a joiner, planer, or table saw where you need infeed and outfeed. Now, granted, you can get a larger, longer lathe between centers, but you don't necessarily need a ton of room behind it or a great amount of room you know, to either side of the center because once you have your centers out, that's, that's all you need. You don't need a bunch of infeed, outfeed. That's a good point. But they are messy. I've, I've seen Cremona sit there and walk oh, yeah. up of uh, wood shaving. <laughs> that's just to raise it up so it's a little higher for me because you know, I'm so short. It's nice. <laughs> nice all right well retro weld says what was the driving factor that made you want to start doing youtube for me it was watching great youtubers like you guys that inspired me to do my to film my first video well thanks for that um but what was the driving factor that made me start making videos uh first it was i did some stuff on lumberjocks put some stuff on lumberjocks had a positive response and you know it's like oh that made me feel all warm and fuzzy so I'm going to make a video to uh, <laughs> to show the project. So I made a couple videos, put them on Lumberjocks, and it just kind of snowballed from there. What about you, Nick? Um, I was, uh, yeah, same thing. I, I wasn't Lumberjocks. I forget what forum I'd been on since, gosh, it was like 05, 06, something like that. It was um, one of the woodworking forums. And uh, so just basically kind of a written, um, I wouldn't say tutorial, but kind of a, a a diary, and then you could attach as many pictures as you wanted. So I did that for a long, long time. But luckily, my wife was the one that kind of pushed me into starting a channel because I was making that theater workstation, that cart. And uh, I 
got all the materials for it and started building it. And she said, you'd kind of be a fool not to videotape this. That way, if you do want to start a channel, at least you have the footage because she said this is going to be a pretty cool project. And definitely one of my more popular videos to this day. So I was really glad that she uh, kind of kicked me in the butt to do that. But uh, Matt, what, did, uh, what was your reasoning? <laughs> um, I had wanted to do it for a long time, and I tried to do it a bunch of times. And I think the way I went about it was kind of wrong for me, at least at first, because I was in front of the camera trying to talk to it and explain what I was doing. And it, it never worked out very well. I just couldn't get any good words out or concise sentences or even finish anything. So I pretty much gave up a bunch of times. And then in 2014, in the beginning of the year, I'm like, I should probably just do this, get in front of the camera, get good at you know, talking to a camera and, and just talking in general, which I'm still working on, but <laughs> I'm getting there. But that's really what I started as, just kind of a self-improvement kind of thing, more than anything. Yeah, I used to be so shy with it, too. Like, the first... I don't know, 30 or so videos, you barely saw my face. And if you did, I was like walking away, like, you, know, you barely see me. Uh, let's see here. Oh, we got Matt, Matt's question next. Back to me. Jeremy, what, what's the wood you like the most? Um, probably walnut. <laughs> it's a pretty simple one for me. Either walnut or cherry, those are the ones I work with the most. Um, I like the look of cherry better when it's finished, but I prefer working with walnut as far as workability goes. Jay, what about you? Is budget involved? Like, is, is budget an influencing factor? Because if it is, then my favorite is pine. <laughs> but if it's you not... Don't, you, don't like, you don't like spruce or fir? You're more of a pine guy. Well, we can, I can only get southern yellow pine here. It's crazy. Well, some of the 2x4s are, are fir. Um, but anyway, so... <clears throat> I guess if I could fill up my shop full of one wood, probably Sapili. I really, really enjoyed working with it in, in a couple of projects. I still got, I still have quite a bit of it left. Um, yeah, I'd I'll, I'll say Sapili. It's really nice. I know for me, I, I came from, a, whether it's late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of uh, arts and crafts, mission style, you know, whether it's quarter saw or regular oak. And I'm just kind of glad those days are behind me because that's just such a, a poor, kind of a fibrous wood. There's a lot of splinters that you can get. Sanding is just kind of a pain in the butt. So I think my go-to is maple, but uh, of course maple is complemented nice with walnut. So I, I definitely like working with walnut as much as I can as well. We got the next question here from uh, KSFWG Dave. What projects have you done on YouTube that you wish you hadn't, or what project would you put off doing maybe for some years? And then, uh, let's see here. So you finally said to yourself, I should have done that years or months ago. Um, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I was going to allude to this later, but um, my wife's just glad. Being I do YouTube videos, my projects actually get done now <laughs> because I have some accountability. <laughs> I mean, I have plenty, uh, and I mean plenty of projects that I've started over the years that this, they weren't getting done, but now that I have a YouTube video that has to kind of accompany it, um, it's kind of a, a motivating factor to get it done. But I don't, for me, it, it's, there's no real one particular project. If, if I do a project and I don't like how it turned out or I don't think I had the skill set, I always just kind of look at it as glass, glass half full that I must have learned something along the ways, at least, you know, learn from my mistakes. So I don't, I don't think there's ever like a time to say, I wish I wouldn't have done that or I wish I would have done it sooner or I wish I would have done it later. Jay, what about you? Yeah, as far as what I wish I hadn't done, there's not, no such thing because as soon as it's it done and say you don't like it, then you just move on. That's all there is to it. So you just move on to the next one or something. But something that I should have done years or months ago, um, I would say two things. My miter saw station, as soon as I moved into my shop, I, sh I should have done that. That was just like the biggest increase in organization for me, uh, organization and just efficiency for workflow. Having a place to put stuff is, is very handy. Um, what else? Uh, the other thing would be the that modified poke table thing. The assembly table is what I'm calling it. I wish I would have done that a long time ago because just having a big work surface with all the dog holes that you can set up for stops is very, uh, it's very handy. And I wish I would have done that sooner. What about you, Matt? I'm um, kind of the same boat with both of you guys about things that I wish I hadn't done. I mean, because really, I've, I've 
done a video on pretty much everything that I've done, and I'm not really upset about anything. I've learned things from like the things I didn't think would turn out as great. They were learning experiences, and everyone else seemed to enjoy the, the content anyway. So there's nothing really that I wish I hadn't done. Um, things I should have done, I think I'm with UJ with the storage thing. When I moved into the shop, I was I spent like a month like getting it ready to like the, with the electrical and dust collection and you know paint and all that stuff, but I didn't build any like decent storage. So for a few years before I did any storage projects, I just had stuff everywhere because I didn't have anywhere to put things. Nothing had a home, and that made it kind of a little more frustrating to be in the shop. Right. Completely, completely agree. Paul says to each of you. You being ex- <laughs> you are being <laughs> escorted to the electric chair. What form, I might add. Um, <laughs> your last meal is what? My last meal will probably be a pepperoni pizza from Little Caesars. Wow, <laughs> hot and ready. High flute and stuff there. High well, and also, hot he, and ready. He also said, he also said uh, a favorite beer as well. Favorite beer? I I don't like the fancy beers. I like the watered down crap. Like, what? Well, uh, I don't drink hardly at all. Like natural light. Like I barely ever drink. Seriously, like once or twice a year. That's about it. Matt, you want to take this one? Um, I'm gonna go with pizza as well, but probably not a little Caesar's pepperoni. Maybe something uh-huh. a little fancier. I don't know what, but probably not that. I I would say. Oh yeah. What What about the beer? The beer, um, I like Downtown Brown. It's probably my favorite beer. It's a darker brown beer, ale, brown ale, I think. Oh, okay. I, w- I would say uh, either sushi or, or something Asian, you know, Thai- something from Thailand. Um, I like spicy. I like saucy type stuff. So anything um, Asian with an Asian flair. And then my favorite beer, I would say, is, is Bud Light. Just a... Uh, you know, I, I like the micro brews. I like the handcrafted stuff. But I mean, if if I want to sit down at the end of a, a long Friday or something and have a six pack or something, I'll just probably just pick up some Bud Light. Real qu- <laughs> real quick to get back on the Little Caesars pizza thing really fast. <laughs> like my wife and I have eaten so much Little Caesars pizza that I designed the trash can in my kitchen right now so that'll fit three Little Caesars pizza boxes in it <laughs> with the lid shut. I'm dead serious. Like, I'm I'm probably gonna redo that project because I stained it and um, that's back when I was making everything in uh, amber shellac, pine and amber shellac. So it's like this big yellow blob in my kitchen that matches nothing. So I'm probably gonna re- redo it and then make it uh, stain it the same color as I did those two by four bar stool things. But but yeah, you then get, huh? Paul said uh, going escorted to the electric chair. Uh, for the record, I want to go out by firing squad because I think that's got a little bit more uh, oomph to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the question, the thing that's not being asked is like, what do we do to get to the electric chair? I, I'm sure we don't want to know. Yeah. All right, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> that was a morbid question. Anyway, a lot of us can't afford a Festool Domino. Is there anything cheaper we can buy? I know about biscuits, but they're not as structurally sound as Dominoes. Um. There really isn't anything cheaper that you can buy that's going to be that kind of portability and that kind of strength. Uh, you could go like um, and uh, speed. dowels and speed. Yeah, exactly. The Domino is extremely fast, it's extremely strong, and it's really easy to use. Um, you can go to dowels. That's kind of the same thing. It's got a little less speed than the Domino and maybe a little less strength because you have you know less, uh, I'll call them tendon materials. Um, but of course, if you want to go you know, a little bit even cheaper, you can choose your router with an edge guide and make your own floating tenons. It's going to be a little bit more time-consuming because you have to set the fence and the bit depth and all that stuff. But, I mean, it's essentially the same thing at that point. A little less portable. Well, I don't know portable, but, like, harder to handle, I guess. You wouldn't want to be, you know, routing into the end of a, you know, a one by 2 style or something with a big router. That would be interesting without some kind of support thing. So you got to build some kind of support thing to rest the router on, to then do your thing. So it's a little more setup involved, but it's possible. Yeah. I'll I, I, s- go ahead, Matt go, or Nick. Well, I was just going to say, I, that's a really good point to bring up because yeah, the dominoes are expensive and I don't know if we'll allude to this later, but woodworking is one of those neat hobbies to where you can make money from starter tools and build up. But it's also a good point that Matt brought up about say like a spiral, maybe spiral upcut bit in a router. 
And if you, if you wanted a dedicated jig, dedicated router to where you, you know, set up, you're eliminating setup time, you're still going to be a, a quite a bit cheaper than, um, say, a Domino. Um, yeah, I, just, I, I guess I, I dig the router idea. And if you're going to go with a, uh, any type of doweling jig, I always kind of recommend something a little bit nicer because dowels can be kind of finicky. If, you, if you're dealing with a cheap jig and you're going to get inaccurate you know, results, it's kind of a pain in the butt to try and line up dowels and, and they don't want to line up for you. But um, Real quick, an, an alternative that maybe a lot of people don't know of is uh, Triton has, I don't think it's available in the U.S. or maybe discontinued uh, overseas or whatever, but Triton has a, what is it, a, a dual doweling cutter. So it plunges just like the domino, plunges just like a biscuit cutter, but it's two drill bits making two dowels at the same time. And mm. I think they are at a fixed width apart, and I think both drill bits are 10 millimeter, and I don't know if they have um, interchangeable bits or whatever. But uh, yeah, search the Triton Dual Doweler. I think that's what it was. Is it like a kind of like the biscuit joiner and domino kind of setup where you, you can bring it onto the work and plunge it in and everything? Yeah, it's the exact same setup. So it's the 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 bit the, the um the dowel domino. Yeah, dowel domino. Doweler, the doweler domino. All right. You're All okay. right. Moving moving right along. Uh, Bruce Hurlbert said, uh, if you could only make one type of outdoor furniture to sell uh, to the public to make a living, what would it be? Uh, one type, I would I would say, um, if I guess if it's a classification, I would say picnic table for me because. You can do different lengths, uh, you know, so it seats different people, whether it's single-sided, dual-sided, you know, multiple species, whether it has cup holders, doesn't have cup holders. So one simple, say, picnic table, you can have probably 30, 40, 50 variations and um, not necessarily, you know, just batch out a bunch of the same ones. What do you guys think? I wouldn't, well, first off, I'd say it's almost impossible to make a living off of outdoor furniture. Uh, specifically because outdoor furniture is seasonal. You're not going to sell much in the wintertime. Um, and I, I dabbled in it a little bit. That's how I started building my shop was with some outdoor stuff. Um, but I sold benches and picnic tables. The picnic tables had a little bit higher um, profit margin, but the benches sold a heck of a lot more and uh, were quicker to make. So... I don't think there is one particular set that you can make a living off of. I mean, if you're making outdoor furniture, just make a bunch of different kinds. Benches, tables, chairs, uh, planter boxes, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I was going to say pretty much the same thing, Jay. It's kind of hard to just do one thing. I mean, people are going to want a set, maybe. If they're going to have a, if you make a table, they might want the chairs to go with it. Or a bench with the matching chairs or whatever. There's a lot more products that you could be doing besides just one thing, and that that brings up a good point Jay said about like a like a planter box. If if you're making say picnic tables and you got like one foot off cuts, mm-hmm. what are you gonna do? Burn them? No, you might as well. Yeah, it's a good idea. Make some uh, planter boxes or whatever. Yeah, uh, Michael Lud- Michael Lawing says favorite non woodworking channels slash genres. Um, there's a couple that. Uh, that, that I'm really excited about when I see in my feed. Um, wh- one is the chess website. <laughs> I really like <laughs> <laughs> watching chess on YouTube, which sounds extremely boring, but I get into it. And then um, the King of Random's a good channel. He's got a bunch of just crazy off the wall stuff. I, w- I would say for me, um, because I'm an immature person, I follow a lot of the prank channels, to where they're, where they're just constantly messing around with people. I don't know. I find that funny. Um, somewhat still in the building genre. Um, I would say ClickSpring has been a, a go-to channel of mine lately. ClickSpring, that's a good one. I forgot about him. He's a good channel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very well-produced videos, very smart guy. And it's about the, the home machinist workshop. And uh, definitely check that out, ClickSpring on YouTube, if you guys haven't seen him. I'm going to say Epic Rap Battles of History. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Epic I get pretty battles. excited about those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> totally did not see that coming from you. <laughs> I didn't either. That's crazy. <laughs> All right, Matt. You're up. Do, 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 do. This is from Joshua. How long after you started woodworking did you decide to start making videos and posting them on YouTube? 
Was there any other intent to recording your woodworking other than posting it on YouTube? Well, I kind of got into this earlier. So a year after I started woodworking, I started making videos with the intention of posting them on YouTube, but never did. So I guess it was seven years after I started woodworking that I actually started posting them on YouTube. And my intent was always to post them on YouTube. I I was in woodworking for many, many years. I've been at it a little bit over 20 years, and I've been on YouTube for less than two. Um, and then as far as uh, recording, yeah, I mean, it was to put it on either Facebook or YouTube and to kind of show people what I was working on. Um, I'm not quite sure what, what the other reasoning behind uh, videotaping what you're doing would be. <laughs> Uh, my, my original intention wasn't to try and make a living at YouTube. It, it quickly became that um, as people really seemed to kind of uh, gravitate towards my stuff and, and enjoy it. But, uh, um, you yeah, know, that's the only reason I record it is to, is to kind of show people what's, what's going on. I, I started, uh, well, let's see. I started woodworking for about a year, took a two or three year break, and then got back into it for another year. And at that point started uploading videos, like I said, for Lumberjocks and stuff like that. But after about three months in, uh, I think I saw it was Steve Ramsey made a video on the, you know, this is my full time gig now and I'm doing this full time. And I was like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Like no disrespect to anybody else or not trying to be arrogant, <laughs> but if someone else can do it, what do I need to know so that I can do it? And then at that point it was just like, I guess that kind of started the, started the, the intention of, you know, keep it going, keep, you know, push the snowball kind of thing. Um, but yeah, the original the original intent was to share my stuff on on Lumberjocks and stuff like that. Very cool. Uh, let's see here. Moving along, Nick C uh, wants to know how long does it take to edit your average video? Um, how let's see here. How have you been able to cut editing time since you started? Looking forward to the Q and A. Um, me, it it varies. There's not necessarily such a thing as an average video for me, anyways. Because that's kind of what keeps it interesting for me. I try to always inject whether it's a different camera angle, whether it's a, a sped up process versus a different cut versus maybe an animation or an overlay. But it it is a lot longer than I originally anticipated. I would say from kind of a middle of the road project with building the project, videotaping it, editing it, publishing it and all that, I would say at least 30 hours a week. Really? But you know, that, that can vary. Yeah. I mean, once again, I'm not doing you know, super complicated projects all the time as well either. I'm guessing you're going to say it probably takes you a little bit longer, but... Well, I'll say less. I mean, I've, not... all, not, oh, but 30 isn't, isn't editing. That's the building of it and everything, so... Oh, well, he says, how long does it take you to edit your average video? <laughs> I, would, I would... Well, I would say... Answer the question, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would say anywhere from 6 to 10 hours. <laughs> Yeah, to edit. Yeah. I mean, it all depends. Like that TV lift cabinet that I'm working on, I probably already have 20 to 24 hours worth of editing in it. But I, but I also started with, you know, 15, 18 hours worth of footage. So yeah, an, an average video I think is a six to 10 hours is, is is probably a good number. The, the, you know, you're gonna have your longer ones, more complicated ones that take a while, like the doghouse video I made and the. Uh, Let's see, the doghouse, the chest of drawers, those two are probably my most, like, pulling my hair out long editing sessions. Um, but these days, like, the more you do it, the more efficient you get at it. I do anyway, and search for shortcuts here and there, and, of course, keyboard shortcuts and all that good stuff to uh, get you through the program faster. But it's, it's funny because, like, so I recently started doing the whole cloning thing, and I've gotten great feedback from it. I'm not the first person who's ever done that, obviously. You know, it's been done many, many, many times before. But <clears throat> I guess it appears to be a little bit more difficult, which by the way, it's never I've never done green screen before in my life, so all that's just stacking clips and masking and stuff. Um so it appears to be, I guess, more complicated, but in actuality it is really cutting my editing time and, and drastically down because you're only setting the camera up one time and you're recording two shots as opposed to doing one task and recording three different angles. So it's, it's really, really cut my editing time down. So the, um, let's see the, uh, coat rack video that I did, I edited that one relatively quick. It wasn't that long at all. I want to say like three hours, something like that. It wasn't long at all. So the more you do it like anything else, the quicker you'll get at it. Matt. 
Um, so I have like three, I guess, styles of videos. I have my shop update. I've got like an Ask Matt, which I can be a little bit quicker. And then I have my full on build videos. Um, my shop updates usually take me about uh, you know, three hours. Well, this is just editing. So now I'm posting stuff that goes along with it, which is even more time. Um, Answer the question. Two, two hours to edit that. Yes, yes. Two hours to edit the shop update or so. Uh, and asking that will probably take me about four hours. And then a build video will take me anywhere from uh, 12 to 20 something hours to edit, depending on the complexity of the build, how much footage I have, and you know how much is going on. So, like, my flooring video took me probably at least 20 hours to do because it was, there was just so much. There was like, I went for like, like years worth of footage, hours and hours worth of footage, tons and tons of steps, going through a lot of that process. So, and then the narration on top of that, which takes me forever because I'm terrible at it. That's exactly <laughs> well, why I, mean, I don't do it. <laughs> Another thing That's where a lot of my time goes is narration. Another thing that I wanted to add to it, like I said, it's, yeah, it depends on, you know, I was talking to another YouTuber the other day and I said, if you start out with, say, like a seven minute video, just kind of as a fun, um, you know, just a test, you know, try and cut 30 seconds out. Try and have your overall message still there, but try and cut 30 seconds out of what I would consider either slow pacing or stuff that may or may not be boring. And so that's kind of something that, you know, you can sit there for four hours and you can call it done or you can sit there for two hours and call it done. But if you, you know, and then there becomes a point of diminishing return to once you spent seven or eight hours editing, you could spend another seven or eight, but you're not going to, it's not going to really be that much different. But uh, yeah, it can, it can take a while. Oh yeah. Let's see. Uh, Keith says, should I buy a cheap Ryobi or similar tabletop drill press? And upgrade later or wait to be able to afford a nice floor stand one. I'm kind of like not impressed by drill presses. They drill holes. Every one I've had has just been whatever. <laughs> um, let's see. I had a like a like a little itty bitty like one eighth horsepower drill press. I, I think it was a one eighth horsepower drill press. Itty bitty little thing. And um, that thing stalled out on like a three quarter inch Forstner bit. So vastly <laughs> underpowered. <laughs> um, but the one I got now, I mean, it's, it's like a 13 inch Harbor Freight model. It's, it's pretty well rusted up from the, uh, humidity here in the summertime with the garage door open and such. And, um, you know, it, it drills holes. And as long as the table's square to the drill bit, that's really all that matters. The, I can tell that there's a little bit of run out in it, but you know, it's, you're drilling a hole in wood. It's, you know, it's precise enough for me. So... Would I say upgrade later? Um, I'm still waiting on the upgrade later part, so, <laughs> you know. I, I agree and disagree. I, I do have a cheap, you know, tabletop one right now. But like Jay had mentioned, I mean, it, the Forstner bits, and you know, they bog down. And, and so, but that's one of the tools that I have no problem with buying uh, cheap and then upgrading as your needs see fit. I mean, if you're doing a lot of, say, cup hinges in cabinet doors and you're doing a lot of Forstner bit work, um, then I could see having a, a decent drill press. But if you're finding yourself not going to the drill press that often or not you know, going, oh, this is bogging down that often, then uh, you know, save your money and put it towards something else. Yeah, I'm still waiting for the upgrade as well. The drill press I have is a tabletop one. I bought that as one of my first tools when I started woodworking. I still have it. It's a Ryobi one, just like, it's, it's like Keith is talking about here. But I don't have a problem with the bogging down. I had the first time I ever had it bogged down when I was is when I was drilling a one inch hole in half inch steel plate this year. That was the first time I've ever been able to stall it. And I've run three and three quarter inch Forstner bits in it before. Wow, drilling wizards. wood with that. And that was fine as well. So maybe this just has more power in it than the, the normal one. I don't know. How much but does it a problem? How much does a three and three quarter inch Forstner bit cost? Thirty bucks. Yeah. That's a big yeah. chunk of chunk of spinning bit oh it, it is big yeah it's a lot it's a lot less scary than those weird those uh that spinning knife thing yeah that, the knuckle that scares the bejesus out of me <laughs> yeah cause you can't see it until until your knuckles all blow <laughs> like oh that's where it was it was hitting my knuckle <laughs> <laughs> who do we go oh i'm next i gotta scroll down the page here look at that here's a long this is from michael yes what yeah, Matt's I'm up. Next. I'm next. We talking about? Oh, that? sorry. I was totally totally wrong then. <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is from Michael. What one thing do you know now that you wish you'd been told prior to going full time YouTube uh, woodworking? Um, I don't really know. I don't really have a good answer to this because um, I was doing it for 
for fun and, and stuff before I went full time. So I kind of knew what I was getting into. I knew the time commitment was going to be ridiculous, which it is, but it's fun. Um, I don't know. You guys got any good uh, words of wisdom on this one? Well, yeah. I, I, I'm not full time, but uh, computer time. I think Jay and I were talking about that yesterday uh, a little bit. I wish I would have known there was more. Because you watch the video as a viewer and you see a guy out in a shop and he's woodworking and he's doing all that. And that's the fun part. And that's kind of, I came into this as a woodworker. But the computer, the editing, the filming, the uh, writing of an article or the posting of it, then the social media. So a lot more computer time. I wish I would have known that. Yeah, exactly. There's, you know, like you said, the editing, the the uh, recording part of it, then once you edit the video, then you have to you have file management, keeping up with all the crap that you have on your business as far as all the files go. And of course, if you're doing a website, then there's website articles, and then there's, you got to do pictures for the articles. And if you have any documentation to go with it to to disperse for plans and such, there's there's just so much more to it that I did not know uh, existed before doing it. You know. Yeah. Moving right along, Corey James from Ontario, Canada. Matt, can you explain the milling process for joining boards before a project? Specifically, how many stages do you mill the material in and how long do you wait between each stage to give yourself the best opportunity to have the best results in dealing with wood movement? It's kind of a multi-part question. And then Jay, random question, are you a smoker? You always seem to be coughing in your vlog video. <laughs> <laughs> And then, Nick, who are your two favorite YouTube woodworkers? Um, big fan of all three of you guys. Please stay motivated to do what you do. Your loyal viewers rely on your experiences and skills in woodworking. Always thanks, guys. Uh, Matt, if you want to touch on that milling part first, and then we'll get to I don't uh, know. I'm kind of curious about Jay's uh, smoking habits now. Yeah, we might have to have an intervention. Yeah, right, yeah, skip to that first, I think. Let me jump into there. So <clears throat> back in <laughs> September ish. No, first off, no, I don't smoke. I. You know, don't smoke. So September ish, I started working with um, it was walnut and sapili, and that killed my sinuses, and I haven't really recovered from it. I guess you could say since then. So I haven't gone to like a sinus doctor or a throat and nose specialist or whatever, but it's my sinuses. They keep <coughs> they keep making me cough, <laughs> and it's driving me nuts. So I know it's driving people nuts who are actually hearing the ones that I don't edit out, but yeah, it's, it's my sinuses. I've got to go to the doctor, but man, ain't nobody got time to sit in the doctor's office all day. <laughs> Gosh, I got to go, but you know, so it no. brings up a good point though. When you're, when you're dealing with woods that you haven't before, it's always best to wear uh, respirators when you, uh, you know, when you can, and then just kind of get to know, um, whether you react to a, a certain wood, a certain way. I'm the same way with walnut and myself. I, I, I'm sneezing cr like crazy when it's, when the walnut, but right i must have immunity there you go <laughs> you want to you want to touch on your uh, milling process? sure sure thing. <laughs> um so i typically joint in probably at least two uh maybe three depending on the thickness of the initial stock how flat it is and what the final thickness is going to be so much most of the stock that i start with is going to be four quarter and that is usually around an inch and a sixteenth or so the stuff that i mill after drying. Um, so the first pass will probably be around 15 16 I'll let that sit for a few days, let it do its thing, and then maybe mill it flat again, which could be as little as a 16th out from there. And then the third time I'll do it again and go to final thickness if I really need to go to final thickness. Typically when I'm building my stuff, I'll just keep it at the thickness that it ends up at. So most of my stuff isn't three quarter, it's more like seven eighths or you know 13 16 or something ridiculous like that. Um, and that's kind of the way I go about it. So that third milling is what I call my joinery. And then after that point, the boards will usually stay very flat because I've, I've brought them down to that final thickness in a very gradual state and allowed them to, to move as much as they want to before removing the final amount of thickness. It's a good way answer. more patience than I. <laughs> well, it takes some lead time, but yeah. I mean, if you're like you're doing other stuff, you just kind of kind of know the flow of your shop so if you know you're going to start this project next week sometime or in a month from now you can do your first milling a month from now and let them sit for a long time so it's just kind of just knowing your your flow of things i guess more than anything is that all kind of in your head or do you actually you know schedule things so like hey i should mill this you know beginning of the month or is that just kind of all in your head that's kind of all in my head i know like where when i'm getting to like 
closer to the finish of one project, I'll start the milling of the next one. Hmm. I do. I do kind of similar from from rough saw and stuff. I, I always like to throw it through the planer for a couple passes, and if I know if I'm going to work on it in like a week or so, I just like to throw it a couple times through and then and then come back to it. But uh, and then addressing the third part, um, Nick, your two favorite YouTube woodworkers, pick one for talent, one for entertainment quality. I'm going to bend the uh, question slightly. Uh, my favorite for overall entertainment quality, not a woodworker, but he's a metal worker, uh, and it's AVE. And if you guys haven't checked out his channel, <laughs> God, that guy is funny. I mean, you gotta you gotta make sure that uh, you're not offended by uh, by co- <laughs> colorful language, we'll say. But that guy is absolutely hilarious, and I'd love to have a beer with that guy someday. Uh, and then pick pick one for uh, for talent. Um, that's really hard to narrow down. One, I've been a big uh, fan of Frank Haworth for a long time. Uh, just some of the uh, kind of off the wall stuff he comes up with, and uh, even like Izzy Swan has got some really cool, uh, cool builds. So that's a hard, hard one to nail down for just one. I'm curious. Uh, that question was directed towards me, but I want to ask you guys that one. Yeah, Your was, two favorite YouTube woodworkers for entertainment, and then for talent. I was gonna say for talent, like someone that really sticks out to me is Guy's Woodshop. Mm-hmm. He does some really, really nice stuff. His small secretary he had with the tumbler door, whatever that's called. Tambler. Tambler door. See, I don't, you know, fancy stuff. Woo. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> that was that was a really, really nice project. I really enjoy watching his stuff. And then what about for uh, entertainment quality, Jay? Frank Howarth. Yeah. That dude can tell a story. Frank Howarth videos. <laughs> I'm just like, you know, <laughs> just so intrigued by his videos. It's so crazy. Yeah. Matt, what about you? For talent, I'd probably say David Buff. He does uh, period furniture work. And for overall entertainment quality, definitely Matthias. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's, he's definitely got people always uh, on the edge of their seats, that's for sure. Got me every time. <laughs> All right. Paul says, how is working for yourself different than what you had expected? Um, it's not really a whole lot different. Uh, the vast majority of it is just kind of, you know, what you do expect. You're working for yourself. You set your own schedule. You, you set your own agenda. You, you have to live with the results of the day. Um, uh, different than what I expected. Time management. That's something that I didn't expect to be as difficult as what it is. Just (laughs) making sure I'm being productive and not, you know, sitting in the hangout with Nick Ferry. (laughs) because <laughs> there's not much productivity when that happens hey this came out of that <laughs> yeah that's right good thank you Matt. The, no problem this Q&A came out I got your back you're no problem I'm here for yeah. you Matt what about you for uh, working for yourself different than as expected well I expected a, I mean I, I it's like one thing where you, you know it's like when you read a book but then you actually go do the thing so I knew what to expect, but I didn't really understand what to expect, I guess. That's probably not a good way to put it. But like for instance, I went from financial security to essentially financial insecurity. There is no guarantee that I'm going to get a paycheck every two weeks. There's no guarantee that paycheck is going to be the same amount of money. I don't get vacation days. I don't get sick days. Whoops. I don't, you know, all that stuff is gone now. So it's, it's one thing like, oh, like, I knew that was going to happen, but it's like now I'm like, Oh wow, that actually happened, and it's a totally different experience than the normal working world. Mine, mine wasn't any different than I expected because my my day job is something. It's it's a company that I've owned for the last well ten ten plus years. So working for myself isn't really any any different in that regard. Uh, granted, I'm not doing YouTube full time as of right now, but um, I definitely like the YouTube part of it a lot better because the um, the audience is essentially your customer and it's a lot nicer than my customer base that I have <laughs> on my day job. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, Matt, you got the next one. Oh, yes, I do. David Cortez and and Christopher. Okay, two people asked, any chance this Q&A can turn to a podcast? Um, I don't know, can it? It's um, I guess it's audio. Sure. Yeah, you'd have Maybe. to... What do they call them? An RSS feed or whatever. I have, I have no, I'm not a podcast consumer, so that would you guys would have to figure that one out. It could be, but um, I guess that depends on how many people out there would want to listen to it. So that's a good point. That's a good point. I guess I might us, listen to it. Yeah, let us know. And if it's just if it's just one of you guys out there, then I'm sorry, but one's <laughs> not going to cut it. 
So, so if you guys like this, then and if you're interested in it turning into a podcast, definitely share it or let it know. I mean, what were we gonna do? We're we gonna post this in, in a video on one of our channels or all of our channels or how are we gonna even do this? I don't know. We'll figure it out. If later. they're watching it, they'll know. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, you guys know more than I do currently, the viewers. But uh, if you like it, however you're consuming this, um, share it. Tell people about it. If if it's something you guys want to see more of, that's for sure. And if it's free booted on Facebook, then just share it again. <laughs> Noah Fargo wants to know how long have you been woodworking? Uh, me, a little over twenty years. I got started very, very young, um, around eleven or twelve years old, and got a little crosscut saw, handsaw, and some uh, screwdrivers, and like a little uh, quarter sheet uh, palm sander, and just started building knickknack type, uh, you know, little wall sconces or little, uh, little, you know, decorative shelves. So quite a while for me. I took a break shortly after starting woodworking because I had to sell all my tools because the tr the motor in my truck blew up, so I had to rebuild that. But uh, I would say if you add up all the time, five years, not long in the grand scheme of things. I'm at seven years. Seven years and, uh, what, like four months. Seven years and four months. All right. Uh <clears throat> Beveroni? Am I saying that right? <laughs> I go for okay, it. Okay, sure. I, guess. I apologize good. if it's wrong. Beveroni. I follow a number. I follow a number of DIY and maker channels, and have come to realize <clears throat> that many of you are making a living doing this. How does one get cash flow to work? Uh, psh, the best answer to that is to Google how to make money on YouTube, how to make money on a website, and don't believe the first thing you hear. Just read a ton of stuff, and you'll eventually start to see a theme. Um, and if you are interested in making money online, whether it's videos or podcasts or articles or blogging or whatever, um, there's a lot of very, really, really, really good sources. But check out um, smartpassiveincome.com. Pat Flynn's got a, just a tremendous library on making money online. And he'd be a lot more, uh, I guess, certified to tell you that than, than me, all the little ins and outs. <laughs> Yeah, and we, we touched on this quite a bit in the beginning. Um, I think breaking up your revenue streams because you're, unless you got you know millions of subscribers, you're probably not going to do it on YouTube um, ad revenue alone. So I, I, I second Jay saying read up on it and definitely yeah, smartpassiveincome.com. Um, Pat Flynn is definitely a good resource. Diversification. Yes, that's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> Just like everything else in business, you don't want all your one all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, I know. I learned that from Enron. Anyways, you can write a lot. Rob asks, what software do you use to edit your videos? I use Adobe Premiere in the cloud. CC. Whatever, it's 2015 now. I use Final Cut Pro 10 for Mac and then Adobe Premiere on occasion because I also have the uh, Adobe CC cloud. Yeah, Nick's a Mac user. I'm sorry. <laughs> um... <laughs> I started out using Kden Live in Linux and built my editing computer. It's a just a uh, quad core processor, which doesn't play too well. It didn't at the time play too well with Kden Live. I could only use like one or two cores, which makes the computer kind of useless for building it. Um, so I switched over to Windows, unfortunately, and um, I actually asked uh, Steve Ramsey what editor he uses, and he just said Sony Movie Studio. So I picked it up. It's pretty cheap. I paid twenty nine or thirty nine dollars for it, and it did everything that I asked ever asked it to do. Um, but then I, at the same time, was using a Creative Cloud membership, so I was using it for Photoshop and InDesign. Um, and Premiere Pro is included, so I figured why not take a you know take a whim and and, and learn that program, and I uh, really 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 like it. But you said it was too complicated, and somebody had to convince you to try it. Who who might that be? I have no idea. I don't know. He's it's a handsome interesting. fellow. He's a handsome fellow. Either way. <laughs> T Ty Mose <laughs> wants to know, now that you've been woodworking for quite a long time, if there were, uh, if you were to do it all over again, would you have focused more on traditional hand tool methods? Um, me, I, I would consider myself kind of, kind of a hybrid woodworker. I'm more uh, to the energized, powered tools but um, meeting certain people and seeing how um, you know people's work habits, 
uh, has shown me over the years, even, you know, going to see Matt Cremona, um, <laughs> so, some of the, some of the stuff you can just, you know, whip out a block plane and get a quick chamfer or, you know, clean something up. Um, I, I don't necessarily have any regrets though, as far as my, um, my lineage, as far as how I've developed as a woodworker. Matt, how about you? Um, I kind of wish I did. So when I started, um, pretty much all the information I had was really power tool focused and no one was really focusing on um, how um, hand tools can complement power tools to make things come together easier or, or whatever. So I do wish that I had more of the hand tool stuff in my work earlier because I could have seen that it was a lot more of a valuable way to go. Um, obviously, you see my work now, you know that I use uh, hand tools in my work quite a bit because I kind of realized that at, the, at one point, I'm like, wow, you can really get a lot done with hand tools really quickly and really just finesse things perfectly with your hand tools. And it, it's just not possible with power tools most of the time or it takes longer or whatever. Yeah, I, I don't think I would have focused more on traditional hand tools because both of what I started woodworking is, you know, I started mainly um, building outdoor stuff and, and selling it, trying to make profit. So I mean, the vast majority of what I was doing, the machine's a heck of a lot faster. So that, you know, focus, or factors into your bottom line. And then once I started making YouTube videos, again, you're trying to make a video a week, which is an absurd standard that has somehow been set. <laughs> um, but you're trying to make a, a one video a week and, you know, take every little advantage of time that you can get. So I don't think I would have focused more on traditional hand tool methods. Although these days, like, Sitting down and, and cutting a hand cut joint is just something I do to get away from the technology of the computer, like taking a break from this, you know, just go out there and cut some hand hand cut joint and take a picture, put it on Instagram for no reason whatsoever <laughs> other than to just take a break from the computer. And an, another thing I reference, I always go back to the, the television series Little House on the Prairie, whose main character was Charles Ingalls, kind of a turn of the century um, homesteader. And uh, I have a feeling if you handed him a cordless 18-volt uh, impact, he'd use it. It wasn't, it wasn't about nostalgia or tradition in his days. <laughs> that's what they had to work with, so that's what they worked with. But a lot of times, you know, hand tools, they, they do help out quite a bit. So I just had to add that. <laughs> All right. Instant – why do I get the hard names? What is this? Instanstiv? Inst instant Instantiv. Yes, what Matt said. I do apologize. Instantiv? <laughs> I can't. I can't read. If in five years YouTube shuts down, what do you see yourselves doing? Um, I don't see myself doing anything uh, drastically different than what I'm doing now. If YouTube shuts down, there's going to be another video platform that you can host your videos on. Uh, if not, you know your own server, as far as website stuff goes. But um, that goes back to what Matt has has pounded into everybody: <laughs> diversification. So. Um, <laughs> Yeah, YouTube, literally, like it's getting t towards the end of the year. So YouTube has been, I was just doing some numbers, and YouTube's only been 23% of my business revenue as far as directly YouTube stuff. So YouTube isn't, uh, I mean, I would personally hate to see YouTube go. I love YouTube, right? But it's, if it shuts down, it's not the end of the world as far as the business goes. I'll just put my video somewhere else and focus more on some other type of revenue stream to hopefully make up for it. Mm -hmm. Matt, what do you think? Same thing. Yeah, Jay, Jay does make a good point. It, um, YouTube may may go away. I, I don't see that as a likely scenario, but uh, video will not go away. It's just it's it's here to stay. Um, I think I would be still in the woodworking if if in five years, anyways. <laughs> but, no, good point. Good, I mean, I'm, I'm not going. You know, if I manage to do YouTube full time, I'm not going back to my day job. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather go flip burgers. I think at this point. <laughs> All right, this next question is from Chris. If you could only use one type of finish on your projects, what would it be? In other words, what is your go-to finish you typically use? Mine is Armor Seal, semi-glass. I use it on pretty much everything. Mine would be spray lacquer if I had a booth, and it would be satin spray, spray lacquer out of HVLP. Um, so I haven't done much in as far as finishing goes. So... That, honestly, I haven't done it in a while to be, just because I don't like the smell of it. Um, but lacquer, brushing lacquer or spray lacquer, it just dries so fast, especially if you're spraying it outside in the sun. I mean, 
by the time you get to the other side of your project, if it's like a cabinet or something, if you're spraying it out in the sun, then it's already dry. So you can put like 10 coats on con consecutively almost, it seems like. Um, it would have to be lacquer. But these days, uh, because I don't like to uh, get that smell into the house because the, the garage is attached, I've been using some water-based poly. And uh, it's all right. No complaints out of it. I also like the wipe on polyurethanes as well, whether you, you buy it pre mixed or if you make it. I just, you know, I, when early in my woodworking, I did a lot of brush finishes, and that just drove me up a wall to try and get brush strokes out of my finishes. But the next question uh, doing whatever tweeted, and yeah, if you guys have questions, you can definitely tweet at us. Um, do you have a heating system in your shop? If so, what type? What are the potential dangers besides fumes? With a propane heater, heater, and then also Andrew uh, was saying that he lived in Elk River, Minnesota, where uh, he heats his shop with a wood stove. I find that over the winter months that I'm either heating it daily just to keep it warm, um, or if I'm absent, uh, I lose the motivation to go out and heat it. Matt and Nick both live in cold climates. What do you guys do to heat your shop? Um, I have a natural gas uh, forced air, kind of a furnace, but it's a ceiling mount, like a Modine or a hot dog style heater. And my walls and garage door are insulated. As of right now, the ceiling is not. That's definitely on my to-do list. It's been on that list for three years. But um, pretty consistent, even heat. If I were to build the structure from from start, I would love radiant in-floor heat. Oh, Matt, nice. what do you say? Yeah, yeah. yeah. In-floor would be nice. Yeah, I use the, um, the garage forced air uh, natural gas heater as well. Um, it's great. These, you know, it's direct vents, so you don't have to have, you know, you're not sitting in the fumes. You can get a, a high efficiency one so you're not combusting the air inside your shop as well. And that's an option. I used to use a torpedo heater, a kerosene one. Um, that works. It's really hot and it works really well, but you're standing there in the fumes. So that's, you have to have, you really, you absolutely, absolutely have to have air coming in to the, the shop to make up the air that's being combusted so you don't you know, die in there from <laughs> the carbon monoxide. Um, <laughs> Rule and number one, don't go die in your shop. Don't go die in your shop from something like a heater, from air. <laughs> I guess another thing worth noting, too, is if, if you're um, running a dust collection and you're exhausting exterior, that pilot light that's burning, um, you can also get um, you know, the fumes in from that. So that's not something you want to do while, while heating that way. I mean, if you're heating electric, you know, radiant, then you're fine. But, uh, yeah. Um, I don't have... Well, right now I, I put in a, an air conditioner in for the summertime. It, it's also got a heat pump in it. I haven't gone through the full dead of winter with it, so I don't know how well it's going to perform. Um, hopefully it does pretty good. Uh, but last year I used, what did I use? One of those single brick propane heaters. No, I live in Mississippi, so it's not crazy cold. Uh, our cold winters is probably like, you know, three or four days in a row where it doesn't get below freezing. That's crazy cold for us, it seems like. You know, Maybe the lows will dip into the single digits once or twice. Um, wow. I know it got that cold down there. Yeah. Yeah, occasionally. Wow. Like, it, everyone freaks out. Like pipes. You're pretty rugged. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm anxious to see how it does this year as far as that, that uh, mini split. But last year I used that little propane heater, which made it stink horribly. Uh, and then that smell kind of ventured into the house a little bit, which I don't like at all. And I used two electric radiant heaters, which drove my light bill up crazy. I didn't think it did the first <laughs> month or so. And I was like, oh, I'll just keep using them. Uh, it kind of bit me in the butt. And then, um, so that's mine. But I will say this this instantly popped in my head. Ronald Walters on YouTube, uh, he did a great video of, of him um, doing radiant heat in his bottom in his shop floor. And he also did radiant heat on his driveway yeah. <laughs> because he said the convenience of that far outweighed uh, the convenience and cost of having a radiant heat driveway in the winter months far outweighed him going out there and shoveling it, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, plus one for the radiant heat thing. Yeah. There was a lot of stuff going on under that slab in his driveway. A yeah. lot of stuff buried in concrete there. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy, crazy stuff. So check out Ronald Walters on YouTube. He's got all kinds of cool stuff. So are we are we nearing the one hour mark here? Yeah, I think we've actually just clipped it. We're just about to pass it, actually. Oh, okay. Um, I'll bring up again uh, the question about should this be a podcast. Um, that's a that's actually a really good question. Um, if you guys want to see more of this, depending on how we post it, definitely let us know in the comments section. 
if this is something that you guys enjoyed. And uh, it was kind of cool to be able to hang out with Matt and uh, Jay. And then, uh, what, and if you guys have any more questions, I, we were going to at least do one more of these, right? Because we have a, a handful of questions left. That we still got a pretty good stack of questions here. Yeah, I think yeah. we got about halfway through. Oh, a little bit so more guys, than halfway. So if you guys have any other questions, make sure to leave those, um, you know, wherever wherever this is getting posted. Yeah, we're not exactly sure wherever this is being posted. Uh, but by chance, if you don't know who we are, uh, this is Nick Ferry. Where can we find you all, all your stuff, Nick? Uh, you can just search YouTube under Nick Ferry, or you can find all of my stuff at nickferry.com. What about you, Matt? Very similar. You can search me on YouTube, Macromona or macromona.com. And I second that, third that notion. Just go to Jay's, <laughs> jayscustomcreations.com. There you go. Well, I appreciate it. For everyone that stuck around for the, uh, the entire time, definitely appreciate that. It's kind of cool to be able to, to answer some of the questions you guys had. Yeah, hopefully we'll be doing this again soon. But until then, see you guys later, and uh, thanks for stopping by. See you guys later. Goodbye.